The fact that God made a new covenant in the New Testament flies in the face of everyone that calls himself a regular Jew. They never recognized Jesus as the Messiah, much less as God in the flesh. I guess that's why they killed him. He did call them children of the devil, didn't he? He also told them repeatedly in the Old Testament that he wanted repentance and not sacrifices, even as early as Isaiah, the first chapter, which was around 760 BC. The Jews never acknowledged this, and the Father planned it that way for the new covenant, which is built on better promises, and we'll look at that in a little while. Let's turn now to Hebrews 8, chapter 8, and start reading in verse 1. Now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. It pretty much tells you that if man didn't make it and the Lord did, then this is spiritual. It can't be physical or carnal. Let's go move on to the next verse. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. This is talking about the Aaronic priesthood. The high priest went into the Holy of Holies once a year, to offer sacrifice for his sins as well as the sins of the people. Jesus Christ, who is our high priest as spiritual Israel, has already offered himself on the cross and is still interceding for us with the Father in the heavenly sanctuary, which is the true holy of holies, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. The word example in the Greek is hupodigma. It means exactly that, an example, pattern, or representation. It's kind of like a blueprint for a house. The tabernacle here was also called a shadow, and the Greek word for shadow is skia. It means a shade or a vague outline of something. It's not real defined. Moses was shown the pattern in Mount Sinai, and he followed that pattern. But just like the Aaronic priesthood, it was a shadow to Christ's priesthood. They were both inferior because they were physical. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Christ's ministry and priesthood is the real, of which he is the only mediator who could ever go before the Father for his elect sheep. And his covenant is of grace and is spiritual rather than that of Aaron's, which was physical or carnal. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. The fault, though, was not on God's side. It was on the carnal Jews' side. This is why the writer of Hebrews quotes Jeremiah in the next verses. For, for finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. The word new in the Hebrew is kadash. It means new or fresh. Saw some Jew here on YouTube with his little yarmulke on trying to say, well, this is the same covenant as has always been made with us before. But when the Messiah comes, well, that was about as much as my stomach could handle. Notice something here, though. He is making the covenant with the house of Ju Israel and Judah. To first accomplish this, let's read um, Ezekiel 36 and start reading in verse 24. For I will take you from the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you an heart of flesh. 
and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Let's skip down to verse 31. Then shall you remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good, and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your, for your abominations. Not for your sakes do I this, saith the Lord God. Be it known unto you, be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. Now the huge question, or the elephant in the room is, did God do this with the carnal or Old Testament Jews? <laughs> the answer would be an emphatic no. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 10 and read verse 18. Behold Israel after the flesh. Are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altars? Why would the Bible make the distinction Israel after the flesh? Because Israel in the New Testament is spiritual now. Let's go to um, Luke 17 and read verse 20. And he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come. He answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. The next question is, how do we get into the kingdom of God? Let's look at John 3 and read verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The Greek word for again is anothen, and it means from above. Let's read verse 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Notice how the word Spirit is capitalized. You have to be born of the Holy Spirit, and that is the clean water that is sprinkled in Ezekiel 36 and 25. The Lord sprinkles this on our hearts. When we are birthed, the Lord shows us our sins, and this is why we'd, we would loathe ourselves. Why else would someone repent, like verse 31 says? It's for our abominations. Let's get back to Hebrews 8 and read verse 9. Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they will be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now he will be merciful, but only to his predestinated elect, in that he will pardon us as he has allowed us to repent of our unrighteousness and walk in his statutes. By the way, this is what the Bible says, is loving him, according to 2 John 6, which says, and this is love that we walk after his commandments. Sin is the Greek word harmartia, and it means to miss the mark. When we sin, do we glorify God? No, we are living a life pleasing to self. The word iniquity in the Greek is anomia. It means to violate his law, either by ignorance or just simply by disregarding it. God didn't do this for the Old Testament Jews. Hebrews 10, 28 says, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. We have the covenant of promise. This is the grace and mercy of the new covenant. This is also, well, let's just read verse 13. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. It vanishes away because the Jews didn't continue in his statutes nor his precepts by his design because they were only pointing toward Jesus anyway. They went on to regard their own traditions more holy than the Torah 
or what would we would call the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Old Testament. They still to this day teach the Halakha and the Haggadah, the McClinic and Strong Cyclopedia of Biblical, Ecclesiastical, and Theological Literature says this about the Haggadah. In the Talmud and with the rabbis, the name, this is for the name for the traditional stories, legends, etc. used in the the interpretation and elucidation of the law and the prophets. Many of the Haggadoth in the Talmud are absurd and preposterous, and they are not held by the best rabbin or rabbins as authoritative. They go on to quote uh, Maimonides as their source. Jesus blinded the eyes of the Jews in Luke 19, uh, the 19th chapter, verse 42. And it's no coincidence that shortly thereafter, uh, the book of Hebrews was written that the temple was destroyed. The Lord told the Jews in Isaiah, the first chapter, he hated their sacrifices and wouldn't hear their prayers as well as they needed to repent then. He told them the same thing in Jeremiah 4 and tons of other places in the Old Testament, but they trusted in their carnal or physical things their sacrifices. The whole point about the sacrifices was to teach them obedience, which they never did. He told them to circumcise the foreskin of their heart in Deuteronomy 10, uh, which means to repent. They never did because they never could. Let me correct that and say that only very few of them did, and they are well noted in Hebrews chapter 11. Now, if the first covenant had been good enough, then there would have been no need for the new one. When God ripped up the veil in the temple at the same time they were crucifying Jesus, it was as though, in essence, he was tearing up the covenant with them officially right in front of their eyes. The office of the high priest and mediator can only be performed by Jesus. A mediator has to have the trust of both parties he mediates. In the Old Testament, God killed the high priest if he got one thing wrong or if he just looked at him. The father put his approval on Jesus in Matthew, the third chapter, when he said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. When the father has the Holy Spirit take the veil of pride off our hearts and takes the scales off our eyes, we see our wretchedness and then we are allowed to repent. And the better covenant established upon better promises is opened up to us. The better promises are only for his elect, which is now spiritual Israel. The church of the firstborn, and this is mentioned in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verses uh, 22 and 23. These are spiritual blessings to conform us to the likeness of Christ, which is righteousness, godliness, and holiness. The sacrifices now we make we give our bodies a living sacrifice, spoken of in Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 1. This is when we also deny ourselves and carry our cross daily. We witness about predestination, election, and the sovereignty of God being the true, along with all the holidays being pagan or heathen. Now, does this mean the tie of the spiritual and done away with? Well, absolutely not. That's in the New Testament as well, but that's for another lesson. This lesson is the first of five in a series. The next one will be on the shadow and the very image in Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Hope you all will be there. Thanks.